All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Uh, let's just begin this time with a word of prayer uh, before we begin our session. So I'll leave it open. Any one of us can please pray. Start. Go ahead. Anybody? Pray. I'll pray. Yes, please go. Heavenly Father. Thank you for this day that you've given unto us, Father Jehovah. I commit everybody into thy hands, Father. I thank you for your divine providence, Jehovah, over our lives, Father Jehovah. Thank you, Father. It's no other God to be worshipped better than you, Father Jehovah. I commit everybody into thy hands, all students and our teacher, Teacher Manuel, Father Jehovah. I pray, Father Jehovah, to continue giving me more knowledge, more guidance, Father Jehovah, so that you can lead us, Father, as we are learning, Father Jehovah. As we head towards the end of our, teach, of our sessions, Father Jehovah, I pray that whatever we plan to is going to be for your honor and glory, Father. I commit everybody, even those who have not joined Father Jehovah, that are going to hasten their pace so they can join and we learn together. In the mighty name of your Son Jesus, I pray and believe. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Andy. All right. So uh, today should be our last class. Uh, you know, been talking a lot about uh, discipleship and small groups. Uh, so last week we talked about the characteristics of a spiritual father and mother. Uh, uh, you know, one who is a spiritual father and mother is one who's involved, who's able to correct, to rebuke, to disciple, to guide their spiritual you know, son or daughter. Uh, one who goes beyond you know just a casual relationship to more meaningful relationships. Uh, you know, a, a spiritual father and mother is one who deals with our character more than our gifting, right? So we talked about this, right? Our gifting is something that we uh, exercise, we grow in our gifting, uh, but building our character is also important because it is our character that can help us to function effectively out of the gifting that God has given us, right? Uh, then we also looked at uh, how a spiritual a uh, father or a spiritual mother does not, you know, uh, does not feel insecure, does not feel uh, jealous when their son or their spiritual son or daughter is doing better than them, right? Uh, now, especially in Christendom, we see, uh, not everywhere, but there are times when, you know, uh, we look at the example of Saul and uh, King Saul and David, right? Uh, and how you know, the jealousy came in. You know, because everyone were like, okay, Saul has done so much, Saul has killed thousands, but here's David, he kills tens of thousands. And so uh, somewhere there was jealousy and the whole, you know, the, we know the story, the whole relationship between them was, uh, you know, marred. And so as a spiritual son and daughter, uh, even in the natural, right, when you look, when you have a son or a daughter, you always want them to do better than what we are doing. And the same goes in uh, in terms of you know a spiritual son or daughter. Uh, we are to encourage them. We are to lift them up. If they are doing better than us. Better than us. You know, celebrate them. Uh, you know, publicly you know, exhort them, encourage them, uh, and help them to do what they are doing. Right? Uh, spiritual fathers and mothers can make mistakes, uh, but here's the thing. Uh, Especially, you know, in ministry, when you go up, as you gain a certain kind of maturity, everyone you know, value your advice, value the way that you are as a leader. Uh, and sometimes we make mistakes, right? but a true or a genuine father or mother uh, will acknowledge the mistake they have made and correct themselves. Right? Uh, because the thing with uh, you know, especially pastors and leaders who've been serving for many years, we are so used to giving advice. We are so used to getting people to do things. Right? We, we are used to being in this position of leadership where we tell people what to do. Uh, and sometimes when we get feedback about how we must change certain things in our life, we can take it the wrong way. Right, we can say, "Hey, how can you tell me? You know, I'm 20 years in ministry. You're just five years, uh, and we may not say it, but we may think it. We may feel it in ourselves. You now, a true spiritual father or a mother will be willing to correct their mistakes, 
uh, willing to take feedback, uh, correct their mistakes, correct their wrong, and move on. Now, here's the difference. What I've noticed is sometimes uh, when you know when a spiritual father or mother is corrected. Uh, we should never come to a place where saying, "Oh, I've made something wrong. Uh, I've done something wrong, uh, or, or you know, I'm, and I acknowledge my mistake." So I don't think I'm an effective leader. Now we know that's not from the that's not from God. Right? Uh, take correction, acknowledge the mistake. Okay, I made this mistake. Make correction and continue being the leader. You don't have to step down. You don't have to say. Now again, it depends on what kind of a uh, uh you know wrong that has happened but if it's something simple you know where you feel that you've got angry and you, you know, by mistake you have you know in that in that anger you have shouted at somebody in your team uh, you don't have to step down for that you, know, you acknowledge your mistake you say okay hey uh, i'm so sorry i was got angry i let the uh, you know i let myself get angry and i bursted out in anger so i apologize i hope i you know i just pray that uh, each of you would forgive me and uh, you know we'll just get back to doing what we were doing before and i myself will you know, go back to the word go back spend time in god's presence uh, ask god for forgiveness and and move on right i don't have to think of it and keep dwelling on it no, right so we ended this last week's chapter by saying that no spiritual father or spiritual mother is perfect there's no one perfect but god right so there will be uh, you know, people who make mistakes, and we as sons and daughters, if we have spiritual fathers and mothers, uh, we must be willing to forgive them. Don't hold back grudges. Don't hold back. Uh, you know, and say, you know, he said this five years back. Uh, let it go. It's five years back. All right. So we closed in that. Uh, today we will talk about this the final portion of our course. Uh, and let me just pre present the notes. Yeah, lessons from uh, Timothy, Paul and Timothy's relationship. Right, lessons from uh, Paul and Timothy's relationship. Now, if we look at the epistles, um, uh, if you read the book of Acts, how the apostle Paul, you know, chose this young man named Timothy. Uh, now we must understand, Timothy was approximately about 17 18 years he was a young man right and paul was probably you know if he when he he started his first missionary journey when he was probably about 50 years old so um timothy he met during his second missionary journey. so we can say probably about 53 50 53 or 54 years old now you see the age gap there's 153 paul is about 53 years old and now you got Timothy, who was about 17, 18 years old, young man, right? And how did this relationship grow? What are the lessons that we can learn from this relationship, right? So we'll just look at a few uh, points here, and then we can bring this entire course to a close, right? So this is the background. Paul is, he's, he's probably around 33 years old when he had the encounter in Damascus. Uh, three years in Arabia, 14 years of uh, silence, so 17 odd years he was uh, you know, away from the ministry, he was in Tarsus, nobody knows what he did there, and then uh, Saul, uh, sorry, Barnabas goes, finds Saul of Tarsus, brings him to, uh, to, uh, uh, to the church, uh, and then later they come to Jerusalem, church in Antioch, and then from Antioch they come to Jerusalem. So. Uh, he, that happened probably when he was about 50, and the first missionary journey was about two and a half to three years. The second missionary journey, uh, Paul and Timothy meet each other. Right? Second Timothy 1 and 2. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, this is the last letter Paul is writing uh, to Timothy. Uh, now it's interesting no uh, paul had started so many churches so many leaders he has raised up um and uh, and you know there was so much that he had to say he's already written a letter to the church in ephesus he's written a letter to timothy before this and now he's writing his last letter the last ever letter he's going to pen uh, with his own hands and he's saying to timothy my dearly beloved son 
so look at this. Let's look at the points that we can learn from this. This lessons from Paul and Timothy. First one, it was a divine connection, right? Now, Acts 16, 1 to 3, this is what happened. Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Right now, the Paul has finished his first missionary journey. He's starting off in his second missionary journey, but he decides I'll do one thing I'll go to Galatia and I'll visit all the churches that I met in the first missionary journey. So he goes to Iconium, Lystra, Derby. And when he came to Derby, there's Timothy there. And the church in uh, Derby is saying, This young man, Timothy, uh, he's full of zeal. You know, he, he's, uh, uh, you know, he's full of zeal. He's probably volunteering in the church. And, uh, and, and so there was a good report about him. Now, his father was a Greek, his mother was a Jew. So Paul says, Okay, Timothy. You want to come with me? There was an immediate divine connection. Right? Uh, immediate. I, I, I feel it would have been in such a way that Paul would have seen Timothy and said, Oh, one day this man, this young boy, can be a great leader. And maybe Timothy saw Paul and thought, Oh, how I wish I could go with him wherever he's going and see how the ministry is done. A divine connection and we can make out because when divine connections are will always last for long most of the time they last for long right now Barnabas remember before this Barnabas goes and he says hey uh, I need help in Antioch let me go searching for this man named Saul of Tarsus I met him many 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 years ago we lowered him down that basket and he ran away, but uh, I remember him. Let me go search for him. He goes to Tarsus, brings him, and comes to Antioch. Now, it was a divine connection by God, but later on we see that you know, there, was, there was this whole conflict between them. Right? Uh, now, it's not that that divine connection broke off. Right? It was just a conflict that caused them to go separate ways, but towards the end, uh, Paul writes in his letter, and he says, uh, I forget, I think it's uh, First Timothy. He, he says, bring John Mark, because he's helpful for me in my ministry. Right? So divine connections, be sensitive to divine connections. God will set up divine connections in our life. God may send Timothys into your life. God may send you as a Paul into other people's lives. Right? So be, be sensitive to these divine connections. Right. Now, it could be something very simple. Right? Uh, uh, I remember you know, when I was in uh, Bible college, uh, there's this young boy, right? and uh, he had come from a, from a different, uh, from, you know, from North India, where you know, things are very, there's not much of English, it's more of the regional language there. And he had come here to study. And during the first week, I had, I, you know, he hardly spoke any English. He, he, you know, he didn't know what a guitar is. He didn't see a guitar, right? So he was in these most rural parts of North India, right? Uh, very, very lonely, uh, you know, interior villages of uh, North India. And he had come to a city like Bangalore. And the first week itself, somewhere there was a connection, right? Um, uh, I don't know if it was from him, but for me, somewhere I felt I'm connected to him. So I would always tell him, hey, you come sit next to me. And he would speak in Hindi, he would say, Paul, you know, and he would speak to me in the reason he say, I don't understand anything what the teachers are saying. They're talking English so fast. I don't understand anything. It's better I go. It's better I don't stay back here. And I remember, uh, you know, uh, but he was very, very you know, matured in Christ and he really wanted to learn. So I remember telling him, you know, you have this one year. 
this one year right in first year if you don't improve your marks then you go back you do a hindi go to a hindi bible college and learn. but give one year a chance and, and that one year he you know we would stay together every single day every moment of the day we were like you know he would you know he would he would keep listening to the readings of sermons and he would keep asking he would write down these words english words and say what does this mean and then you know and he was a wonderful prayer warrior he would he could pray right? and so i would learn from him and say how do you pray what are, you know you're praying for hours how do you do that and uh, he we would sit and pray together and it's so wonderful to see that you know he completed his two year course he's gone back to his hometown he started a church and he's one of our outreach pastors right now uh apc uh, outreach pastors so so you know at times god brings these divine connections right and uh, he can you can be a timothy or you can be a paul sent to others lives so we must be willing to do that right it's a divine connection two it's a special bond first timothy one and two unto timothy my own son in the faith I look at the second Timothy one and two. Timothy, my dearly beloved son. Second Timothy two one. Therefore, my son. Corinthians to the Corinthians, he writing First Corinthians four seventeen. For this cause, I have sent you Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord. Right? There was a special bond, a special relationship between Paul and Timothy. Right? Paul considered Timothy as a spiritual son. And Timothy, I'm sure, looked at Paul as a spiritual father. Right now, here's the interesting thing: it didn't happen overnight. Right, Paul is writing uh, Timothy maybe at least seven to eight years later uh, to writing to Timothy at least seven to eight years later. But in that seven or eight years, he has seen Paul doing the ministry. He has seen the apostle Paul being beaten being put to prison he's seen paul being you know going through challenges going through uh, persecutions and turmoil and physical illness mental illness just this uh, uh, you know but he's also seen the ministry he's seen healings he's seen miracles he has seen paul's prayer life the faith you put him in prison paul is praying i'm sure Paul wouldn't have said, you know, come and see, I'm praying in prison. Timothy would have come, would have seen, how is this guy praying in prison? And I'm sure it would have captured his heart. He would have thought, oh, man, how can you do this? Uh, how can he be so a man of such faith? But he was a special boy, and he learned. He learned. He would have seen it. Right? And Paul is so wonderfully saying, he's my son in the faith. Never does Paul say, Oh, he's you know he was a little boy. Now I took him, uh, yeah. So he's been to be, he's been helping me. Uh, no, he says he's my son. Right? There's a special relationship. Third one, a special closeness and transparency. Second Timothy three ten and eleven. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. You know, there was, there was, the Apostle Paul did not tell Timothy, you know, hey, um, Timothy, come on, join the ministry, it's good fun, we can go to places, we'll just preach about the gospel, now people will give one to the Lord, we'll use it, we'll travel, we'll see these beautiful places. Uh, you know, we can go Asia Minor, we can go into Europe. Uh, things will be good. You'll have a good life. Then, you know, whenever you want, you can leave. No. The Apostle Paul knew and made it clear to Timothy, Timothy, there's got to be challenges. There's going to be people who will mock us, ridicule us. They may beat us, they may put us into prison. All these things may happen. So it's not it's not something that is, you know, it's not like okay, everything is easy. Right? There was such a closeness and transparency which Apostle Paul allowed Timothy to see and and really know who the Apostle Paul was. Right? 
now what did the apostle paul do he responded by following or turning himself after what he saw in paul i'm sure when he you know i can just picture this right going back to ephesus paul is saying Timothy, you are now the leader. You are the pastor in the church of Ephesus. Now you, there's already bishops and deacons and leaders and elders and all of that there in the church. Now he's sending this young man, probably in his early, early 30s now, um, and he's telling Timothy, Timothy, you're in your early 30s. Don't let anyone despise you. Go look after the church in Ephesus. And I'm sure the, Timothy would have thought of all that he has seen the Apostle Paul do, and he would have, you know, just pattern himself after. Hey, this is what Apostle Paul did, so I'll also do this. And there was a closeness, there was a transparency between each other. The best part is Apostle Paul allowed Timothy to see his life, to see his sufferings, to see his, you know, to see the miracles, to see the goodness of God, and also to see how, you know, ministry is can be a joyful thing even through persecutions right and eventually put him in the most hostile place which is Ephesus yeah. fourth one communication of specific instructions right first Timothy 1 18 this charge I commit unto thee son Timothy according to the prophecies which went before thee that thou by them be mightiest war a good warfare. Uh, this is the, the King James version. Uh, but the other versions, the New King James say, uh, to the prophecies which are given to you by the laying on of hands that you may wage a good warfare. Right? So Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, you, there were prophecies made about you. Maybe I have made some of them and others have prophesied over you that you're going to be a leader now here is your opportunity right they're putting you in in Ephesus so you wage a good warfare right hold on to the prophecies that were spoken about you first Timothy 6 20 oh Timothy keep that that which is committed to thee by trust that to thy trust avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of signs falsely so called here paul is instructing timothy teaching him what to do what not to do what pitfalls to avoid what are the other things that we must do now if you read first and second timothy it's a lot of instructions now it's not like paul was you know just arbitrary writing to timothy he knew timothy needed these instructions right and, and so very clearly so as a as a spiritual father and mother we can call them sons, we call them daughters, we love them, but it's also our responsibility to give instructions. Right? What are the things that you know teaching them what to do, what not to do, what are pitfoil pitfalls to avoid, what are things that worked, what are things that didn't work? And we just release it to our uh, you know to people who are our spiritual sons or daughters. Now, for example, ten years down the line. If you know, if there's somebody that I'm ministering to, I'm mentoring, they say, "Hey, I want to start a church." I'm sure, you know, I can I can give some kind of input, right? Some kind of instructions. Why? Because okay, it's, it's been some time. I've, I've I've made my share of mistakes. I've learned. Okay, this is how we can build a church. These are the things, you know. Just because it's a church doesn't mean it doesn't come with problems. There are, you know, a church is uh, a group of people. Right? And people are of different characters, different temperaments, different likes, different kinds of people. Uh, but as a leader, Paul is saying, you must learn how to teach them, how to uh, bring that unity uh, you know, in, in the faith, avoid these kind of pitfalls. And he talks about all a lot of instructions in First and Second Timothy. Right? So it's very important as, as sons and fathers to bring that word of uh, you know uh, that word of instructions right? and then you have also communication of encouragement exhortation and correction paul gave timothy positive encouragement now 
this is one of the most difficult things that we can do in ministry is to administer correction. And it's very difficult because you have to learn to do it in a loving way, be positive, be uplifting. Uh, but if you don't correct your Timothy or you don't correct your son or your daughter in the Lord, things will allow to grow. And, you know, it'll be like cancer that will eat into their life and destroy them. Let me give you this example. Many years back, I was, you know, just talking to this young man, uh, and I felt that he could be a good uh, life group leader. So I said to him, hey, you know, you already got, you know, your God is, I, I see that you're very interested in volunteering, and you, you know, you have this wonderful uh, command over your English and uh, you know your, your desire to lead and you know um, so wh why not you think about starting a life group he said okay uh, uh, sure give me some time so I told him okay here's what we'll do seven six to eight months you attend a life group I'll connect you to a life group. just attend see how things are done so he did that right so six to eight months and even as he attended I kept talking to the life group leader I said how is he doing? Is he attending regularly? Is he, uh, you know, involving in the time of discussion? Is he there for, you know, serving? Is he okay to do the small tasks? Uh, 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 is he on time? Uh, how's his character? Is he talking the right way, or is he? You know, uh, this, uh, it's not like I'm. It's not like we're checking up on him, but just so that we get feedback to make him a better leader in the future. And then over time, uh, uh, it was eight months, uh, somewhere along the time, we decided, okay, let's make him a life group leader. So we called him, and I, and I told him, you know, I was just talking to him, like how you know, a life group leader must have good character, we must learn how to behave, we must learn how to uh, minister, to counsel each other. And then in the course of the conversation, he, he mentioned that you know, he... Uh, so I asked him, what do you do in your free time? He said, I like to watch uh, series, you know, like, uh, I don't know what those, uh, I don't know if it was Netflix or, you know, do you have all those things that, uh, I don't know about all those things, but, you know, these comedy series and all these science fiction series that are there on television. Uh, so he watches them on the phone. So I asked him, how many hours do you spend on that? He said, hey. Every day I watch at least three, four episodes, so that's about three hours. Now that was a concern, right? So I remember telling him, "See, it's it. It may not be a sin, right? It's not you know, what you're watching. If it's if it's not right, if it's vulgar, then just don't watch it. But then, if it's nothing vulgar, but it's just you know comedy or whatever that is. Uh, but as a leader, what you do." is very important because what gets into you is what you will portray outside right uh, now i'm being very careful right you, you know I'm, I'm, I'm not saying don't watch tv don't watch the news we have to we have to keep ourselves updated if you have to watch tv go ahead just make sure it doesn't take priority over your life shouldn't be like oh i want to get back home from work office quickly you know, just rest for a while and then watch Netflix. If that's the case, then you can see that it's becoming a, you know, a bondage. We may say, hey, no, it's not a bondage. But just like, you know, it's the same as drinking or smoking. Hey, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not uh, addicted to it. Uh, just that one off thing. But again, it can become, you know, something that is, you know, constantly eating up inside. And I remember telling this young man, right? He was very casual in the way he spoke. He would crack jokes every now and then. And I told him, see, it's good. It's good what you're doing. Uh, but here's what it is. Uh, what you see and what you hear is what you will bring out as a leader. If you're only watching comedy shows, you'll end up only cracking jokes most of the time. Or if you're only watching all these things that are getting into you, uh, how will you be able to minister more? I'm not saying don't watch, but spend more time in God's Word. 
as a leader you need we need the wisdom we need so then he said okay from three hours i'll i'll not watch i'll make it one hour and he did it right and i remember through the end of it i think it was a year or so now uh, he was so strong in the word he was able to you know learn the word he would ask me for you know uh, uh, bible study material he would ask me for you know uh, material that books to read which book is good for leadership and i would share uh, and i saw that there was this there was this sudden change and one year down the line there was so much of maturity in the way he spoke the way he led the team then he started his life group many people started joining his life group and uh, it was a it's a wonderful life group right and he's so different to what he was before I just felt that if we don't correct, right? If we don't be loving, positive, uplifting, and if we don't bring correction, what happens is it becomes like a cancer, right? So correction is like spiritual surgery. You're opening up the heart. You're opening up inside and saying, okay, these are things that you may have to take it out. It hurts, but the result is positive. Now, on the flip side, there will be times you give these kind of corrections. And the person who's taking that correction may get offended. They may say, how can you tell me? Now, in those cases, you cannot do anything about it. Right? You can just say, see, I'm trying to you know, help you to be a better leader. And these are the mistakes I made. That's why I'm sharing with you. If they take it in the right way, good. But if they don't, they, uh, you know, they start being... They start justifying or they start saying, no, I, I am like this. You know, How are you? How can you judge me? And all those kind of things. Uh, then it's okay. Let's move on. Right? You don't have to uh, you be there to minister to help them. But then don't be discouraged. Go on to raise up many more leaders, many more Timothys uh, for God's kingdom. Right? Communication of genuine cause. It was communication of genuine cost, the price that one must pay to serve God. Again, Paul didn't smooth talk anybody. Not only Timothy, he didn't smooth talk anybody. Right? So if we, you know, we talked about Corinthians last uh, last semester. We we saw that he was quite harsh. Right? He, he, he didn't smooth talk. He didn't say, this is how it is. Okay, it'll be very nice. No. He looked at the Galatians and he said, what's what's happening? Uh, he communicated with them. He didn't say, oh, oh, you know, hey, you know, I, I share the gospel with you all. You believe in Jesus. These people have gone back to uh, you know, circumcision. He didn't keep it in his heart and just think about it and let it become a, you know, uh, a whole feeling of regret and you know hate for on, on the church but he communicated hey this is what i'm angry with this is what you have done and so i'm upset and then he also communicates the good things right it's not only the bad thing but he also communicates he starts off to the galatians by saying that but then later on in galatians he says oh you are children of god you are sons and daughters you are uh, you know you are uh, called for a purpose you you are uh, and he's exhorting them he corrects them he exhorts them same thing he does to the corinthians first letter he says all are just causing so much trouble in the church division strife anger jealousy pride everything is happening there then in the second letter he says oh you are uh, seated with him you are uh, the weapons of your warfare are mighty you are like children of god and you know you have the gifts of the spirit and he goes on to exhort them so communication is very important and this i learned the hard way as well right can I join ministry? I just sometimes I thought, okay, they will understand what they should do. You know, for example, we have a conference, you know, yeah. we tell, okay, this, this is. And over time, I, th uh, I, I thought, okay, they'll understand. They, they must know what to do, right? So whatever I've shared, but it's not so. I say we need to, you know, have good communication. Communication, you know, can avoid these 
errors and it can avoid problems just by communicating to one another in the right way. Here, the Apostle Paul, he laid things out. Right? He invited Paul, he said, come share in my sufferings. He tells the church in Corinth, you people think I'm an apostle uh, and you're questioning the right of my apostle. Now look at this, this is, these are the things that I've done. Right? These are the sufferings I've done. Well, all are my sons and daughters because you all gave birth, you all birth in Christ through my ministry. So I have the right to correct you. So he's just laying it out. There's no smooth talking at all. Right? So uh, in terms of uh, spiritual father and mother, there's a place of bringing correction and love. But there's never a place for smooth talking. There's a difference. Right? Correction is done out of love. You do it genuinely. You talk, or talk in love. Bring correction in love. Be positive. Be uplifting. But it's not smooth talking. Now, just because somebody is angry, imagine you're in Galatia and you, you know, you know, you're saying, hey, we need to get circumcised. And then Apostle Paul ends up there and he says, oh, uh, oh you want to be circumcised? Okay. Uh, see, this is what the, uh, this is what I taught you about. You know? We need to be loving. We now, he can't do it that way. Right? Because he needs to bring it out. He needs to communicate with them what has already been communicated, that if you go back to circumcision, you're just, the value uh, of the gospel, the value of the cross is lost. There's no use of the cross if you're going back to circumcision. Either you go back to circumcision and let go of this, or you come to the believe in the gospel, let go of circumcision. He makes it clear. There are genuine costs. But Apostle Paul, if I let go of circumcision, people will not, uh, you know, they will not talk to me. They will not uh, accept me in their communities. They are, I'm not allowed to the temple to pray. It's a cost. Right? It's a cost that you have to pay. But that's what it is. right? So we see that the Apostle Paul shared the genuine cost. And he communicated with them. Seventh one, communication with regard. Uh, First Timothy 6, 11, but thou, O man of God, again, he's communicating with regard. He's calling Timothy, man of God, no more a 17-year-old boy walking around with me, but now you're a man of God. Right? Second Corinthians 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth with all the saints that are in all of Achaia. Look at this. He called him son. He called him beloved son. Called him man of God. Now he's calling him brother. Right? Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God at Corinth. Timothy spent a few, uh, uh, you know, uh, spent some time in Corinth. Right? So they knew about Timothy. And uh, so he's writing there. Saying he's our brother unto the church of God. Right? Paul communicated with the high sense of regard for Timothy. He's calling Timothy, he's a man of God. Now, sharing this from Apostle Paul, you know, Timothy would have, I'm sure Timothy would have felt, oh man, all these years, all these years of these trials and difficulties that I went through, and to just hear this, from the great Apostle Paul, a man of God, I'm sure he would have been so encouraged. He would have been so, you know, energized or, uh, you know, he would have been so happy to hear it from a leader like Paul. The Apostle Paul recognized Timothy's true worth, his callings, his giftings, and his anointing. Right? Uh, so even as spiritual fathers and mothers, we communicate with each other in regard, we honor each other. Each one of us have different, you know, calling, different giftings, different anointings. Uh, so we must recognize what they're doing. Eighth one, delegation and deputization. 
uh, there was an element of deputization or delegation of authority and responsibility. Now, Paul left Timothy to the care of the church in Ephesus. And through practical training, Timothy was groomed into this man of God. So Paul had, you know, Paul trusted Timothy. He had confidence in Timothy, right? So he delegated Timothy. And this is a wonderful sign of, of a spiritual father and mother, which is train them, trust them, and put your confidence on them. Give them a training. You trust and build, con build confidence in them. Give them responsibilities. There's no point of me training me. Imagine Tim Paul trained Timothy. OK, Timothy, now it's 10 years now. OK, next, come, we'll go to another place. Okay, come, we'll go here. Come, we'll go there. Timothy is probably waiting. Hey, when will my opportunity come? No, a true father or mother will delegate responsibilities. They say, okay, you do it. You can do it. Basically, just pushing you into the water and saying, go for it. You can do it. You can do it. Go for it. Right? And 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 this delegation, is, it's so wonderful. Uh, and I personally have experienced it, right? When leaders just uh, you know you go over this time of training and then they say go for it i trust you i have confidence in you that is such a relieving feeling right it's a feeling of oh uh, you know my leaders trust me they have the confidence and on the other side i'm sure timothy would have said no apostle paul has trust and confidence in me how much more must i prepare myself to look after the church Right, but uh, we must delegate uh, leaders. Ninth one, have a positive recommendation. First Corinthians sixteen ten. Now, if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord as I also do. Philippians two nineteen through twenty three. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him that as a son with the Father, he has served me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I send presently as soon as I shall, I see how it will go with me. After proving Timothy, Paul recommended him positively and enthusiastically. Proved him. He's saying, Timothy is now a leader. Now he's saying, okay, I'm going to send Timothy to you, right? He's writing to the church in Philippi. Now, the reason he's going to Philippi is to, is to bring some of the gifts to take it to Jerusalem uh, because the church of Jerusalem is being persecuted. They go to, uh, you know, to take the, collect the offerings. And what is Paul saying? Timothy, he, you know him. There was no one else like-minded like him. Just like how I have a burden for you, Philippians. I know you all are, you know, uh, sad about my situation. I'm sitting here in prison. I know that you're crying and weeping and you're praying for me. I know that you're hurt. There's no one else I can send but Timothy because he also feels the same way for you. He also feels the same feeling that I have for you uh, uh, as, as one who planted the church. I, you're my sons and daughters. He feels the same way as well. Others seek their own uh, you know, but he seeks the things of God. And I am commissioning as a son, as a father. Uh, he has served me in the gospel. And so it's like I'm sending him, uh, you know, uh, approve of him, receive him as if it is me, uh, as if it is. Yeah. So what a positive recommendation. Recommendations are important, right? Uh, even if you look at the corporate world, if you get a recommend, if somebody is applying for a job and the recommendation comes from a senior manager, I'm sure they you know, they can go up to the next step of the interview process very quickly. Hey, this is recommended by a senior manager, this person. So immediately there's value. There is some kind of a you know additional value added to this candidate. 
Same thing here. Apostle Paul is saying. He's got the same spirit. So imagine the Philippian church waiting for this guy named Timothy. Some of them have seen him. Some of them haven't seen him. Now, and then Timothy comes and everyone are looking at Timothy and thinking, oh, Apostle Paul maybe like this him, just like him. Probably some of them not even seen Apostle Paul. But here they Maybe Apostle Paul had the same spirit. So Paul wrote, he has the same spirit as me. So is he, you know, uh, they're looking at him and looking at Apostle Paul, the same spirit. Right? Tenth one, he becomes a co worker. Romans 16 21, Timothy, my fellow worker. First Thessalonians 3 1 and 2. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it be good to be left at Athens alone. And sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer, look at that, our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Now, we know the problem here. In the church in Thessalonian, Thessalonica, they're all worried. Some of them are saying, hey, the, God, the second coming is already over. Why are we still here? And all those problems. So Paul is saying, okay, don't worry. I'm sending my best man over, Timothy. Go, encourage, establish. He will come there. He will establish you. He will comfort you concerning your faith. Right? Timothy eventually goes from a son uh, or a young boy, a son. He goes into becoming a, 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 a man of God taking on leadership, then he becomes a fellow worker, co-worker. But wait a minute, uh, Timothy is only 10 years in the ministry, but you are 30 years in the ministry. It's okay, he's a fellow worker. Whether he's 10, whether he's 5, but we both are doing the same thing. He's given a place of co-equal in the ministry. Look at that. As sons and daughters, this is uh, must. This must be our heart. Even as leaders, if we are mentoring, as fathers and mothers, we are mentoring people. Bring them to a place where they say, "Hey, he's a co-worker with me. He's co-equal with me in the ministry." He may have to learn a lot of things more. He's still maybe young. He may have to learn a lot of things, but he's co-equal. He's a co-worker in the ministry. Problems arise when the son fails to grow up or, or when the father desires the son to always remain a son. And if the son fails to grow up, if the son is going on doing the same thing, again, go buy vegetables, go do this, go do that, go open the church, clean the church. All that is there initially, but we want to see them growing. Right? And we want to see these sons and daughters taking their place, growing in the word, growing in maturity, and becoming joint heirs, co-workers in the ministry. Our desire is to see everyone mature into a place where each one of us can become spiritual father and mother to others. And, and you know, we can raise up. Each one of us can become spiritual fathers and mothers. That's what we want to do. So just in conclusion, have a vision for your church, for your ministry, for your cell group. Develop a strategy and go to it. Our goal here is not just knowledge, but it is action. Right? So it's not just learning, getting knowledge, but raising up leaders who can become sons and daughters. I'm sure we all are in this, you know, in this walk of life. We just probably you know uh, going on to that place of becoming son and daughter uh, and so take it up I right? don't don't throw it away but be patient let the Lord work and at the right time God will open the right door and you will be able to be a son or a father or a mother to the next generation so that's wonderful all right so we've brought this entire course to a close uh, uh, any questions, any thoughts, anything that you would like to add before we close?
your questions. I hope this course was interesting. Uh, I really enjoyed teaching, learning. Yes, Sri Kumar, go ahead. Just to know one thing, sir, uh, that uh, people used to uh, not only nowadays say a spiritual father, but they also say a spiritual uh, you know, grandfather and all. So these those terminology is right uh, as for the scripture. Uh, because <laughs> because nowhere the Bible speaks about that. Yeah. That's one doubt I have. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay. See, a lot of things in Christianity is, you know, over time it's all made up, right? We we come up with things. Uh, now, spiritual grandfather, again, whether a spiritual father or spiritual grandfather, the, the point is, are they ministering to your spirit? So... It, Biblically, we don't. So if you see the age difference between Paul and Timothy, uh, almost a grandfather, but uh, not really. But uh, see, so Timothy was 17. He, Apostle Paul would have been 50 years old easily, right? 50 to 51 years old. So there was a big gap. Uh, but these terms, you know, Sri Kumar, should not, uh, should not hold us like, hey, I am your spiritual grandfather or your spiritual father. Uh, it's more about doing than just a term. Uh, so I would say that person is somebody who's speaking into your life, ministering to you, you're growing in the Lord. You just leave it as spiritual father. You don't have to say spiritual grandfather and all. Uh, I don't think that's required. So that's my personal Thank thought. So. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. All right. Christopher, yes, go ahead. Oh, yes, Pastor. So I um, just wanted to uh, get some insights from you on, uh, uh, you know, the uh, that church in, in Korea, uh, which has, you know, considered to be the biggest church. And I think one of the reasons is because um, they had, uh, were able to, really um, expand on the uh, uh, cell groups and you know, the life groups uh, within the church. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure if you have any insights on on um, how they how they grew so substantially. And um, maybe there was some maybe there were some uh, you know areas where uh, they were not doing things um, correctly. So just wanted to find out if you had any insights on that. Yes, so uh, so the church that Christopher is talking about is David Paul Young, Church, uh, the Yoido Full Gospel Church. So initially, David, what ha uh, Christopher, what happened was uh, the church was not growing at all. Right, initially for the first two three years, there was still around 100, 150 people, right. But uh, he's written a book. Uh, not sure if I know what the name of the book is. Uh, there are a lot of uh, you know videos as well where he has you know talked about how these uh, the church how the church grew and uh, I forget the name of the book uh, let me just check that uh, so he talks in detail about how yeah the fourth dimension by david david yongi cho right the fourth dimension uh, so that's the book and he talks in detail about how uh, the life groups, the cell groups just began. Now, of course, it didn't just start off like with hundreds of people. It all started small, uh, but he saw immediate growth. Now, it may not be so for all other places. Uh, now, we must also understand that Korea was going through this whole, it was the early uh, 1960s. Uh, they were going through a lot of, uh, you know, uh, pandemics and there was a lot of earthquakes and all a lot of physical dest destructions that were happening it was a very uh, hostile ground korea not like what it is now so i'm sure the lord was doing something additional there was this uh, move of god during that time so we know that it's not a natural growth it is a supernatural growth that it happened in a couple of years that what was just hundreds grew to thousands in a couple of years it is supernatural uh, God was doing something. So if you can get your hand on the book, The Fourth Dimension, uh, he explains how the, you know, the 
uh, the the cell groups was able to grow. Uh, so yes, Christopher. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, right. So any other questions? Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm taking additional time. I just thought we'll close it off so we don't have to meet. Uh, in the Thank next you, Pastor, for the class. Most welcome. Thank you. Most well. welcome. Most welcome. Oh, uh, Christopher, you raise your hand again. Okay, Elisha says, "What are some challenges that an already established church that tries now tries to now adopt cell groups suffer?" Okay, some challenges that already an established church. Now, the moment a church is already established, um. I'm, I'm guessing or I'm hoping that an established church will have at least, depending on the number, you should have at least 30, 40 life groups, right? So uh, uh, some of the things to, to adopt new cell groups, I would say that, you know, uh, the teen church, the teen life groups, the youth life groups is something that we, it's not something that we may suffer, but it will be a challenge to raise up leaders because of what we're seeing now. Uh, you know, youth are open to, you know, homosexuality and this LGBT people are coming into churches. Is it something that we should agree to? And then there's other, or other things, new doctrines. So we must really train up our youth and our teens in the right way so that they will be able to, uh, you know, be effective leaders. So this is one challenge that uh, I would see the new churches nowadays. See, while we were growing up, uh, we just knew one thing, okay, grow up, read the Bible, become a leader, build on that, that's it, right? Not much of the challenges that we see now. There was no social media and all the things that are happening now. But now things are so different. Right? Uh, so I would say one of the challenges would be the teen and the youth to raise up good leaders for them uh, to you know become fathers and mothers. That's one challenge that we will see in this generation. But again, God is faithful. God will raise up people. Uh, but we as fathers and mothers must take that initiative as well. Uh, yes, Christopher? Sorry, I mistook out. Oh, OK, no, no problem. Anything else? Anyone else would like to share anything? Any thoughts, any questions? All right, so uh, keep looking at the stream. I will post the final uh, exam uh, on the streams, on the classwork tab as well, uh, probably sometime next week. Uh, thank you so much for joining along with me for this entire course. I really enjoy it. Thank you for taking time to be here, and uh, it's really good. Um, let's just close in prayer. Right? So I just leave it open. Anyone can close. Uh, in prayer and then exit out. Right. Anyone would like to close? Go ahead. Anybody can close in prayer. Can I pick up? Please, please go ahead, Sri Kumar. Uh, precious Father, we thank you and praise you, Father God, for this wonderful day which you have given to us, Sri God. And we thank you for this journey. O oh Lord, now, so you carried us, Father God. You used your servant, O oh Lord, now, so with wisdom, and Father God, and the insight, and the, uh, and the, uh, and the grace, Father God, in which Lord, now, so he could able to minister to us. Father, we thank you that every valuable word which came out from his mouth, O oh Father, let it, Lord, now, so let it be a precious germs in our life, and let me able to hold it, and Father God, let me able to treasure it with us, Father God, so that in coming days. None of these things, Father God, none of these insights, none of these words of wisdom, Lord Master, we should miss it, but let, we, let be able to use it for the ministry and let be able to raise leaders, let me become an example, Lord Master, as we learn like how to call and the Timothy the relationship. Let me have the divine relationship with God. Please. We thank you, Father God, for using the man of God and Father God and bless us. we pray and bless his family. Lord Master, we thank you, Father God, Lord, give him more strength and grace that he can be used more powerfully in coming days. We thank you, Father God, for each one of us that you prepared our heart to receive from him. And we believe that, Father God, that
that father we will be used each one of us is going to use this lord master this valuable thing in our life for the glory honor and praises belongs to you in jesus name we pray amen and thank you pastor amen. thank you amen thank you shri kumar thank you everyone all the best uh, see you soon god bless thank you so much pastor god bless you too